For some, the concept of marriage is their one goal in life, their biggest dream. They crave having that shiny ring on their finger and the stability, safety and selflessness that comes in the form of vowing to devote the rest of their life to a partner. For others, marriage is a curse. They relish in their freedom and independence, so it's their own personal nightmare to be tied down to one person. Of course, there are plenty of feelings in between that don't stray quite so far one way or the other. And then there are the people who become so engulfed in their own feelings and become entrenched in bitterness, anger and resentment that they only see one way out. Committing auxoricide is the act in which a husband kills his wife, and in today's video, we'll be exploring three disturbing cases of such incidents. Heli Crafts. Born July the 4th, 1947 in Denmark, Heli Lork Nielsen married Richard Crafts in 1979, where they settled in Newtown, Connecticut. Heli worked as a flight attendant, and by all accounts was a well-liked and kind woman, who worked hard at her job and at being a mother. She and her husband had three children together after they married. Richard Crafts was a former marine pilot turned airline pilot and a part-time policeman. He met Heli in Miami in 1969, where each was training for their respective jobs. In 1984, Richard was diagnosed with cancer, with doctors telling him he had a 2% chance of survival, and despite the odds, he managed to overcome the illness and continue on with his life. Despite the couple's seemingly normal marriage, it wasn't long before cracks in the relationship began to appear. By 1986, Heli had begun divorce proceedings after learning of the affairs that her husband had been indulging in behind her back. She'd hired a private investigator and discovered Richard was involved with another air hostess. It was around this time that he told Heli that the cancer he'd previously beaten had come back, but she found out shortly after this that he was lying and that he wasn't ill. On November the 19th, Heli was dropped off at her home by a friend after returning from a flight with work. This was the last time that anyone saw her alive. Over the next few weeks, her husband gave varying accounts of his wife's whereabouts and offered up flimsy explanations as to why she was unavailable to friends and her workplace. Reportedly, Richard said in one instance that Heli was visiting her mother in Denmark. In another, he said she was on holiday with a friend in the Canary Islands. And at other times, he simply said that he didn't know where she was. Friends of Heli grew concerned. It wasn't like the mother of three to just up and disappear without contacting anyone, and they were well aware of Richard's aggression and temperament, having had Heli tell them of the details of her and her husband's relationship. He was reportedly even physically abusive. At one point shortly before her death, she told friends, if something happens to me, don't think it was an accident. She even told this to her divorce lawyer, who described the unusualness of the statement in her interview on the TV show Forensic Files. When authorities were eventually alerted to the troubling disappearance of the 39-year-old flight attendant, they went to search the family home. One of the first things they noticed was the missing pieces of carpet from the floor in the master bedroom. The Crafts nanny recalled that there was a dark, grapefruit-sized stain on one of the pieces of carpet which had now been removed. This had investigators worried, and as they continued to look around, they also found evident blood smears on the side of the bed, and that a large freezer was missing from the home. As they looked into Richard Kraft's bank records, they found that he had purchased several interesting items around the time that his wife disappeared, new bedsheets and a duvet, and the rental of a wood chipper. Papers that were provided to a private investigator by Richard included the receipt of a chainsaw too. The fears that family and friends of Heli Crafts held were confirmed when a snowplow driver came forward and said that he'd seen Richard at the shore of Lake Zoar. A search of the lake found the purchased chainsaw, covered in blood and hair, which was later proven to match Heli. Then, in or near the water, police found further evidence of foul play, including metal pieces, 85 grams of human tissue, including a tooth with unique dental work, a fingernail with pink polish, bone chips, 
2,660 bleach blonde human hairs and O negative type blood, the same type as Heli's. From these horrifying discoveries, police concluded that the remains of Heli crafts had been fed into the wood chipper. To test this theory out, the medical examiner used a pig's body to recreate the damage a wood chipper would cause to the bones, and it was found that the pig's bone fragments bore a similar shape to those of Heli's and had the same marks on. Investigators determined that Heli crafts had been struck in the head multiple times, leaving the bloodstains on the carpet and the smear on the bed, and that her body was kept in a freezer before it was cut up with a chainsaw and fed through the wood chipper. The gruesome disposal of Heli's body shocked friends, family and the local community. The prosecution of Richard Crafts required an official determination of death via body identification, which initially threw a spanner in the works of the investigation, as of course, Heli's body wasn't available. However, after a tooth found in the lake was found to match her dental records, the Connecticut State Medical Examiner's Office issued the death certificate for the mother of three. Richard Crafts was arrested in January 1987, and his trial began a year and a half later in May 1988. The trial ended in July with a hung jury, but a second trial ended in a guilty verdict on November 21, 1989. During one of the trials, Richard's defence team claimed that since Heli was bilingual and could speak four different languages, she could have run off and gone anywhere, since she knew enough in local languages to do so. This argument clearly did not wash with the second jury, who were overwhelmed by the physical evidence. Richard Crafts appealed his conviction, but he was refused, and Heli's three children went on to live with one of Richard's sisters, who sided with the prosecution and pushed for a hefty punishment. Although it's little consolation to the children who lost their mother, the mother who lost her daughter, and the friends and family who lost a loved one, Richard was sentenced to 50 years in prison. He will be eligible for parole in 2021. Laurie Hacking Laurie K. Soares was born December 31, 1976, and was the adopted daughter of her parents, who lived in Salt Lake City, Utah. She met Mark Hacking in high school, and they later went on to marry. The couple lived a relatively quiet, normal life. In July of 2004, Laurie was five weeks pregnant, and she and Mark planned to move to North Carolina, where he would start medical school. All of that changed, however, on July the 19th. At 10.49 a.m., Mark called 911 to report his 27-year-old wife missing. According to him, she'd left for a jog that morning in the Memory Grove and City Creek Canyon area of Salt Lake City, but hadn't returned, nor had she turned up to work. At a later date, one witness would come forward, claiming to have seen Laurie that day, but she then went on to withdraw her claim. As police investigated the background of the couple, they found out that Mark Hacking had never completed his undergraduate degree at the University of Utah, as he'd led friends and family to believe, although his father knew and was the one to reveal the truth. Mark had previously claimed to have graduated with honours in psychology. The North Carolina Medical School had no records of his application either. This immediately made the police suspicious of Laurie's husband. Shortly after Laurie's disappearance, Mark was found running naked through the streets, he was taken to hospital for a mental health evaluation and got himself a defence lawyer. Many law enforcement members speculate that Mark's psychological break was a ploy to give him the defence of insanity or to seek refuge, and they point out that he'd had shoes on while running, as if to protect his feet, something someone would not ordinarily think about if they were experiencing the breakdown that Mark was claiming. On August 2, 2004, Mark was arrested on suspicion of aggravated murder, Police at the time believed that he'd acted alone, killing her with a 22 calibre rifle as she slept, and then dumping her body in a dumpster. There was blood located in several different places in the apartment, including on the headboard of the bed, and on a knife found in the bedroom. There was even blood in Laurie's car, in which the seat had been adjusted to fit someone six feet tall. The police also noted that the bathtub was extremely clean and smelled of bleach, and that the mattress on the couple's bed was new, it was later found that Mark had been purchasing the mattress when he claimed to have been searching for his missing wife. As police were confident they'd gotten their man, Mark's two brothers came forward to put the final nail in his coffin, claiming he'd confessed to them just five days after she disappeared. As a result of their testimony, first-degree murder charges were brought against Mark on August the 9th. 
Several months later, on October the 1st, 2004, at 8.20 a.m., searchers found the remains of a woman in Salt Lake County landfill. That afternoon, the remains were positively identified as those of Lori Hacking. Searchers had also found the carpet she had been rolled into by her husband. On October the 29th, Mark pleaded not guilty to the charge of first-degree murder, despite desperate pleas from Laurie's brother to save his family the grief and cost and plead guilty to murder. Six months later, on April the 15th, 2005, Mark Hacking pleaded guilty to the first-degree murder charge, in exchange for the other charges he was facing being dropped. On June the 6th, he was sentenced to six years to life, the maximum penalty that could be given under Utah law. In March 2006, Laurie's law came into action, which increased the minimum penalty for a person convicted of first-degree murder in Utah to 15 years to life. However, this can't be applied to those already charged, and so Mark's sentencing remains unchanged. His first parole opportunity will be in August 2034. According to authorities, Laurie found out about her husband's lies about his education when she was inquiring at the school about his financial aid. The school told her he was not enrolled there and was not an upcoming student. When confronted by his wife, Mark claimed that it was just a computer malfunction and nothing more troubling, but Laurie later found out the truth. It's believed that Mark came across the gun whilst packing and shot Laurie around 1am. Mark came from a well-educated family who excelled in everything they did, especially his brothers, and that despite being less academically gifted, Mark still felt that he had to meet their standards. Understandably, the sores removed hacking from Laurie's headstone following the conviction. They said, we felt Mark obviously didn't want her anymore. Laurie's mom says she keeps in contact with Mark's family, and that she has forgiven him for her own sake. The sores created a scholarship in their daughter's name. The recipients are women who've overcome difficult circumstances to get into college. Carol DeMatti Charles Chuck Stewart was born in Massachusetts in December of 1959 and was described as a handsome and athletic man. He met Carol DeMatti, born March 1959 in 1980, at a local restaurant where he worked as a chef and she worked as a waitress. Five years later, the couple married. By all accounts, they seemed to lead an average life. In 1989, Charles worked as a general manager for a furrier store whilst Carol worked as a tax attorney and was pregnant with the couple's first child. Not a huge amount is known about the details of the pair's relationship, but it's obvious that something at some point had shifted between them, at least for Charles. On October the 23rd, 1989, the couple was driving through the Roxbury neighborhood after attending a childbirth class together. According to Charles, a black man with a gun and a raspy voice forced his way into the car at a stoplight before making the couple drive him to nearby Mission Hill, where he then robbed them, shot Charles in the stomach and Carol in the head, before Charles managed to drive away and call 911. Carol died just hours later, at 3am on October the 24th. Her funeral took place on the 28th at St James's Church. Just before her death, doctors managed to deliver Carol's two-month premature baby by C-section. He was named Christopher, as per his parents' wishes. But tragically, Christopher had suffered trauma and oxygen deprivation and died only 17 days later. His funeral was held on November the 20th, 1989, and he was buried with his mother under her maiden name. Charles was hospitalized for six weeks and required two operations. Whilst he was recuperating, the Boston Police Department searched desperately for the killer of Carol Stewart and her baby, using the description provided to them by her husband. Eventually, police landed on Willie Bennett, and he was identified by Charles in a lineup on December the 28th. The case appeared to be relatively cut and dry, until it suddenly collapsed on January the 3rd, 1990, when Charles' brother Matthew named Charles as the killer of his wife and child. Matthew explained that he had met Charles that night to help him commit insurance fraud, but when he arrived, he saw that Carol had been shot, and his brother had shot himself to make it appear as if the couple had been attacked. Matthew took the gun and the pair's valuables, including their wedding rings, and threw them off Pine River's bridge in Revere. Some items, including the murder weapon, were later recovered. During all this, police learned that Charles was upset at the idea of becoming a father, 
as he was worried about whether Carol would go back to work afterwards. It was also uncovered that some sort of relationship was had between him and a Fourier employee, but she denied any romantic involvement with Charles. The Boston Globe reported that a $480,000 check was issued via Carol's life insurance policy to her husband, but police couldn't find the check and there was no evidence that he'd cashed it. A TV show then confirmed that Charles had received $100,000 of life insurance, which he cashed after he left hospital. He also bought a new car for $16,000 and used cash to do so. On January the 4th, 1990, just hours after the truth of what had really happened that day was revealed, Charles went to meet his lawyer. Afterwards, his car was found abandoned on the Tobin Bridge in Chelsea. A note in the car claimed he was beaten by the new accusations and was sapped of his strength. Charles' body was found in the Mystic River the following day. Despite his protests that he was innocent, it was later found by authorities that Charles had previously expressed a desire to kill his wife. In 1991, Matthew was indicted for the charges of insurance fraud and obstruction of justice. An associate of his was also charged as an accessory to murder. Matthew pled guilty and was sentenced to three to five years in prison. He was initially released in 1997, but was later apprehended again on cocaine trafficking charges. He died in September 2011 from a drug overdose in a homeless shelter in Cambridge. Willie Bennett, who was originally arrested for the murder of Carol Stewart and her unborn child, said of Charles in 2017, I'll see him in hell, if there's a hell. Carol's family went on to establish the Carol DeMatti Foundation to provide scholarship aid to Mission Hill residents. As of 2006, $1.2 million had been awarded to 220 students. So that was three disturbing cases of husbands killing their wives. Let's hope you truly know your partner if you choose to get married. Stay safe, and we'll see you in the next one.